it was not a stepping stone. It was a trampoline, I'd say. Like, mm. I immersed myself in 23 days of doing Kundalini, Kundalini yoga from 4.30 a.m. till 10, 10 p.m. every single day. With Kundalini yoga, if you come to class and you do it, you really want to do it because it's challenging. It's not just a trend. that It breaks you. It opens you up and it, it puts you to work. It's the main purpose or the main goal to remember who you are, what you came here to do, to connect with your soul yeah. and keep elevating and evolving as a soul. What is your soul telling you that you have to do, that you came here to be of service mm. to? Because life purpose, if it's not 100% aligned to being of service, it's not your life purpose. This is the Human Future Podcast, where we explore the intersection of technology and spirituality with some of the world's brightest minds. Together, we paint a vision of the desirable future and discuss the actionable steps to make that vision a reality. And now, without further ado, let's begin. Welcome, Giselle. <laughs> <laughs> um, appreciate your uh, coming all the way here. Uh, also appreciate you being a friend, a, a dear friend of, of mine and Monica. Uh, we've been, we've known each other for a good amount of years now and uh, had some really amazing experiences together as mm -hmm. well. I've shared some meaningful, memorable uh, moments. Um, I would love uh, to start by you sharing a little bit with the audience. Uh, what's your story and maybe m mainly focusing on the thread of your transformational story coming from corporate into what you're <laughs> currently doing, uh, teaching yoga and uh, being a, uh, teaching your kundalini, uh, kundalini yoga and, and being a spiritual leader in Miami. Well, I don't want to say that. But okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you yeah, can so say that if you please. want, but okay, you know, yeah, I'm like please. very... So yeah, please uh, t uh, tell me uh, how you see yourself and what's your what's that thread of your transformational journey. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. it's so difficult to start. Yeah, yeah. It's always uh, once the the ball gets rolling, then it's, it's, it's it gets easier. Yeah, it's easier. Yeah, but uh, I mean, start just by sharing a little bit about where you come from. You know, uh, how long ago were you in corporate? Uh, when did you leave that? Um, four years ago. Okay. A little bit more than four years ago. Yeah. So share a little bit about what you were doing earlier, and then a bit about the transition. Why? What was the catalyst for you to? to shift and then the work that you're doing now. Yeah. Well, all this, you tell me when I, I start. Started anytime. Now when you're yeah. the, <laughs> we've anytime, already started. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, um, I don't have to say my name. You will introduce me and everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This journey, what I can consciously say when it started, because it started way long before mm -hmm. I had the I had consciousness. I, I was mm -hmm. conscious of this happening. Mm -hmm. Um started four years ago, a little bit more than four years ago. But that was the main transformational milestone to say it in a way. Because mm -hmm. I started before I was working in corporate in I always say it and 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 I don't want this to sound, oh, top position. Yes, I was in a top, very top position in, in corporate for a big multinational global brand, to a Fortune 500, um, which I loved working with. Mm -hmm. I traveled the world that opened my mind. I met beautiful people around the world, and that was my life. I was happy with the life that I was living. And that was the first push to change. I had to leave that company because a lot of things happened with that famous company at that time. Mm -hmm. So I was pushed to leave. I wouldn't have left. At that time, I was also leaving a very important relationship in my life. So two big pushes to change. Yeah. I was always pushed, being pushed to change, mm -hmm. to transformation in a drastic way, because mm -hmm. it's easier to stay in the comfort zone. And I went to other two companies with a lot of synchronicities there, both very famous, one very well known, until I couldn't stand it anymore. I got, let's say, to in marketing to the top that I could have 
and also in the industries that I love. The last one was the beauty industry. I was head of marketing of the top luxury brands in steel in, in the market. And the moment that I realized that I was not being of service, I was just using my skills that I paid. I went to university <laughs> for this with two careers, one in marketing, one in advertising. I did an executive program in Stanford University. And I was using all those skills, but not in the right way. There was something within me that was still not fulfilled. I felt that this is not what I came here to do. I am using my knowledge, my energy, my time, doing what I like, but not what I came here to do. I knew yeah. this was not my mission. That was not my mission. Mm -hmm. So again, I was pushed to, mm -hmm. like a lot of people in this particular period of time that was during the pandemic, or the pandemic, as, as I say. Well, my teacher, Gurmukh, says pandemic, so I, I felt that that was the perfect way to mm -hmm. say it. So during that period, I was again pushed to leave the company that I was working mm -hmm. for, the last one in corporate. And I, I didn't want to continue working in corporate. I enjoyed working, but at home. We had some time to work from home. And even when I was still working for them, because I decided during the pandemic that I wanted to leave in March, but I was pushed to leave in September because I didn't want to go back to an office or... Um, I was living in Tulum at that time. The company didn't even know. I was already in Tulum. I was already nomadic after like three months. I was invited by my partner at that time to go to Tulum to celebrate my birthday. My birthday is the 12th of July. And instead of one week, as we planned, we stayed, <laughs> we stayed till December. In the meantime, we came back to Miami, my apartment, everything together, put in a storage and went back to Tulum. And then from Tulum to Costa Rica, and I was there till mid-March and then back mm -hmm. to Tulum. And again, a lot of things were happening. Those I can recall were the most painful, transformational, pivotal moments of my life. I have some milestones, but this one I remember that was like, really, you cannot continue doing what you're doing. We yeah. gave you too many signs already to let you realize by yourself that this is not serving you or anyone. And we need more from you. Mm -hmm. So through pain, because you can learn from different ways, right? Yes. From grace or from pain. At that time, I was used to learning from pain. So that was the way that I jumped into mm -hmm. the unknown one more time. Mm -hmm. And one year before that, this moment, we are in March in 2020, uh, 2021, one year before in January 2020, before the pandemic, I was so in my Kundalini practice that I wanted to become a teacher. And 15 days the training started, it was canceled. And then the pandemic started. So it was not the right time. So I continued with corporate. I left to Tulum. Then I left corporate. Everything was getting in place for what was coming. So we're now in March 2021. And two days after something very like painful and, and deep happened, there was a breakup that was incredible. All the transformation that that, it was not a stepping stone. It was a trampoline, I'd say mm -hmm. like, when that happened two days after, I see that my teacher, that is Gurmukh, was training, doing the training level one of Kundalini yoga. 
in Colorado and I was in Tulum. Mm -hmm. And I said, I have to do it. So I, I signed up right away without even thinking about it. I knew that the right teacher was going to come at the right time, as always happens, right? And also when the student is ready. I wasn't ready at that time. So in May, I was, I was in Colorado. It took me a long journey to get there because I got sick in Tulum. I couldn't, I couldn't leave bed. Mm -hmm. Like it was like, it was an energetic purging. Mm -hmm. I was, I was unconsciously not wanting to go because I knew it was coming. That was a real change in my life. Everything is different since that moment. So I, I did my training, the first training and I, I went for myself because my main purpose at that time and always at the end of the day was to connect deeper with my soul, with my higher self and get the tools within, learn how to do it without the need of any external support. Because before I was giving my power away to everything, to relationships, to um, healers or psychics or however you want to call them. Like everyone or everybody knew more than me. So I needed, I knew that I had that within as we all have, but I wanted to discover it. Mm -hmm. And I felt deep within that through Kundalini technology, that was the way for me. And I went to the real deal, challenging <laughs> as... <laughs> as I wouldn't have expected because the technology is super challenging. So I immersed myself in um, immersion of 23 days of doing Kundalini, Kundalini yoga from 4.30 a.m. till 10, 10 p.m. every single day. So it's impossible not to get a transformation through that. It was like, okay, you need to do the work deeply to be able to share it with others so you will go there. So I went there. I did my training, I did it for myself, and the transformation that I, that I experienced was so powerful that I, I couldn't not share it with others. I always say that I was already teaching from the plane, coming back. And I started that way. I started in, in my living room, like with eight people, then some more people, 10 people, 12, until one day I remember this is a big milestone. You know, you feel that everyone in this conscious community mm. is real, authentic, and, and it's really of service to others. So I received a message, basically I was focusing on rebirth things, that it's it's a part of Kundalini Yoga and, mm. and we were, we learned how to teach them because our teachers, um, had us go through eight rebirthings during our first training. It was one of the requirements to get certified at that time. And it, it's not usually teached. They don't teach it. They certify you if you go to what we call white tantra, that it's, it's a full day of very deep kundalini training it, it's it's not a training it's it's a full practice. day of of practice altogether mm -hmm. but since the pandemic was in place we couldn't do it so we did the rebirthings and those were the most transformational one for me in the entire training till today mm -hmm. i would say that that for me is a real deal mm -hmm. of kundalini the the rebirthings so i started teaching the rebirthings mm -hmm. And I received a message from someone in the Kundalini community saying that I couldn't do that, that I was, that person was doing that before. It's like saying to a yoga teacher that you cannot do Shavasana in your classes. Mm. So I thought about it for a second and I said, I am not doing anything wrong. I'm sharing what I learned and what really worked for me for a very authentic place. So I had two options to try to look good in front of this person and the community yeah. saying, oh, no, you're right, I won't do this. 
or say, I'm not doing anything wrong right. and I will do it. So that was the moment in which everything started to really unfold faster at a speed and at a magnitude that I wasn't expecting at all. It was a miracle when I said yes, authentically, to my purpose. I moved to a bigger house with a beautiful like waterfront that I wasn't expecting that you remember for sure. I started having big classes, bigger classes. I focused on rebirth things. The classes started to grow, grow, grow. And I have 120 people in my home. And I had to teach on top of a table. So I always remember that moment in which I said, okay, should I play small and give my power to this comment from someone that is hurt within and it has nothing to do with me, with compassion? Or I do what I came here to do, what I'm being trained to do, and stop the BS. <laughs> yep. And I did it. So this is... Every time that I have doubts about where I'm going and if I have to continue playing big, I remember this moment. Mm -hmm. And from there, I started growing and growing and continued training because two years, one and a half years after I did my first training, I went to a second one with the same teacher in India. And I went through, because I wanted to go through the immersion again, 23 days, but this time in India and with my teachers. And uh, that was incredible too. There were so many lessons. We get sick in the middle of the training. I had the best friends that now sisters now for life. Um, one of them was my, my roommate and the other one was in the room next to us, both from Spain. I love them and, and also like other one, other, other sisters, one, another one from the U.S. That we basically been traveling the world and, 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 and getting connected more and more and doing things together. And, um, so I went through the same training again. I, I didn't, I needed to get certified. I already had my certification, but I, the, the power of, the Kundalini technology is so deep and goes so deep within me that I that I, I want to go again. I want to do a third one and more and more and more. Yeah. And that's why I never stopped teaching. And that's why I'm sharing this practice from my experience and from the bottom of my heart and with my entire soul because it works for me. It mm -hmm. worked for me. And I see the transformation in others. It transformed my life 100%. It's a 180-degree mm -hmm. shift to become who I am, yes. who I came here to be. Yes. Um, could you uh, give your definition of what is Kundalini? Uh, and then also the second one is the rebirthing. Is that a separate uh, practice, sub-practice or something? Or is it the same thing? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Kunda, what what can Kundalini is? Kundalini uh, yoga, Kundalini technology is a technology, is a science. And it's the most ancient form of yoga. All the other yoga types come from Kundalini yoga. And it's a yoga of awakening. It's a yoga of connection with your soul. It's a yoga of awareness. Um, and it's really the connection with your soul. Mm. And it combines four very powerful pillars that are and in order of awakening, Kundalini awakening, is chanting mantras, sacred words, the sound a healing sound of the nad. Breath work. Deep breath work. Exercises, the kriya, and meditation. So it's a combination of these four things. And the rebirth things, they are not a different thing. Like... 
the kriyas, the exercises, we have like 3,000 kriyas that you can do. You cannot change them. You have to teach them the way they are with the same timing. They have a very clear purpose to direct the energy, to work on different chakras mm -hmm. related to organs, related to emotions, to mm -hmm. transmute the energy mm -hmm. and elevate your consciousness, your state of consciousness within your own consciousness. The rebirthings are only 33 kriyas, very particular ones, that were kind of hidden. Kundalini yoga was always the yoga for the elite, that mm, it was hidden, it was not shared, only some, I don't know, I don't know how to say it because, it or something. Yeah. yes, I don't know how it is, how it was, but yeah. only a few yogis could learn it because it was very hidden. It was very okay. like, was it maybe protected? It was protected and yeah, they, it was for the elite. I, I don't understand that because to me mm. it's now, of course, it's not that for mm. sure not. It's um, my purpose and I feel that every kundalini teacher purpose is to share it with as many souls as possible mm -hmm. because it's powerful and transformational but at that time it was hidden and um this were shared later on the 33 to some teachers one of them elders one of them my, my teacher and they started to teach them. But not everyone was trained on them. And these Kriyas are so powerful that I experienced, what I experienced after the third one was so deep that this is what I focused on at the beginning. This is what I specialized on in rebirthings. So I started to do the same that worked for me three rebirthings, one after the other, three nights. And I led a lot of groups, a lot of people in these rebirthings. And honestly, when I see where they were when they started and where they are now, they are all thriving. They all found their purpose. They are living their purpose, but it's deep. It's, I remember that every time that I that I teach them the week before when I was doing preparation and consciously for that, I got sick every time. And, uh, and at the beginning when I didn't know how to manage, because it's manage in this case, my energy in a way of not getting depleted after classes, I had to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. Nobody teaches you, but I had to learn it because I was getting sick every time. Like I teach the rebirthing the entire day until 6 p.m., the second rebirthing, sick, in bed. The, sec the third day, the same way, until the end. Mm. So, yeah, these are, these are very, very profound practices, mm -hmm. these rebirthings. I'm not doing them that much now because I'm f flowing with what is coming to me and, and I've been adding more tools to my, to my toolkit, mm -hmm. <laughs> always in, with the purpose of connecting deeper with my soul and from that place sharing, sharing with others mm -hmm. what I'm learning, what I'm experiencing because it's not... It's not the books, it's, it's experience, it's yeah. going through that myself. Mm -hmm. And from that place, I can relate to others. Mm -hmm. So another very important pillar for me, and it's also very important for Kundalini legacy or, li or lineage, is the community. I created my own Kundalini tribe. I created my, my community. And again, it happened organically. In these big classes or smaller classes, people stayed after. They stayed talking. They didn't want to leave. They, they connected. Some of them were 
they they brought some food or something to drink and we were talking and uh, spending time together and it came to me this is a community this is a tribe so i i created the kundalini tribe and i launched a membership and in the first month i already had like 25 members uh today it's we have more we are more than 65 members and growing and and it's a beautiful community that we all get together we gather four times a month for sure in classes because i teach at soho twice a month they come to another class to faena in faena and one to my home and every morning i lead sadhana because we don't teach sadhana sadhana is our personal practice and we share it mm. so i teach i lead sadhana in zoom on zoom at 5:45 a.m. every weekday mm-hmm. and 8 a.m. every saturday and most of the members join for sadhana and it's it's a way for them to connect with the practice but it's also a way for me to connect with the practice because it's not the same to do it alone it it's a beautiful purpose to wake up every morning to meet with them i have a responsibility to do it it's like unconsciously i created this to keep going because i cannot i have to do it i listen to my body when i'm sick when i don't feel well i don't do it but it's a beautiful way to be in integrity with the practice doing it together every morning mhm oh yeah um i want to understand a little bit more and maybe also break it down for uh those who are listening or watching so it's it's a practice that is um centered around connecting to your higher self to your uh core like how would you wh- what is the ultimate result of the practice would you say well i i love your questions i love <laughs> that question what i can say about that question is that for me it's 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 in the mind it's very difficult to reply to to answer that question because mm-hmm. the question the the answer will be very much in my mind if mm-hmm. i reply there's no ultimate goal in the practice itself mm. it's let me rephrase it it's not that there's no goal in the practice our goal as souls come in here incarnated in this physical bodies in this 3d earth planet earth 3d third dimension is to connect with the soul is to get back to the soul because we were we came here because of the soul that chose to come here we were born because of the soul and we die because of the soul but yet we don't find the time or the moment to connect with the soul that it's our essence this is what we are mm-hmm. today i am not today in this incarnation i am wearing this suit but in the next ones i'm a different one but my soul is always the same it's a it's eternal So that is the main purpose to say it in a way to remember who you are and not only what you came here to do what you came here to do would say okay for this particular incarnation what is what is your purpose what is your soul telling you that you have to do that you came here to be of service mm. to because life purpose if it's not 100% aligned to being of service is not your life purpose yeah or your soul purpose. So that would be in your words the main purpose or the main goal to remember who you are who what you came here to do to connect with your soul yeah. and keep elevating and evolving as a soul. Mhm. And in your understanding why does it work? Like you would think oh there're just some movements and some words that I say that for someone from outside might say oh this is a, a 
bunch of garbage. I don't understand what, but I understand maybe logic is not the the method of trying to describe it. But if you had, to, how do you uh, understand the mechanics of how it works, basically? Yeah. Well, when when you were saying that, the word that came to me was the biomechanics, exactly, and that. Uh, I was in the mind. Mm. I was always in the mind, deep in the mind. So for me, learning has to go through the mind. And of course, I have to experience it. But mm. I started studying the biomechanics, how energy works, mm. how this technology works, why it is in technology, why it is a science. Mm. And it's totally scientific. Like you, you can see Dr. Joe Dispenza, the foundation of his uh, teachings are Kundalini Yoga. Um, there are thousands of studies of Kundalini, the, the, the biomechanics and the bioenergetics of Kundalini Yoga and the mm -hmm. Kundalini Tantric Yoga. Um, so at the end of the day is how you move your energy, how you go from a lower state of consciousness that it's living from the lower chakras with all the energy stored in the lower chakra triangle, mm -hmm. that it's your root, your sacral, and your navel point. Mm -hmm. This is where all the emotions are stagnant, the energy of emotions are stagnant, pain, fear, um, sadness, scarcity mindset, all the emotions that are deep rooted in wounds that are also ancestral wounds and karmic karma and how you start moving that energy awakening your kundalini that it's exactly located in this lower chakra triangle mm. and it's the energy that is in the after the fourth vertebrae in your spinal cord when it is awakened through this practice, either the mantras, chanting, either the actual exercises, the Kriya meditation, or the breath work, it goes up. A lot of things have to happen scientifically. The nadis that are the psychic pathways have to be open. They connect the chakras. The chakras are going throughout the spinal cord, adjacent to it, no inside of it. So you have to clear and open and clear and balance all your chakras that are related to an organ and related to an emotion or a group of mixed emotions. Not feelings, it's emotions because it is a stagnant energy there located. And when they goes up to the higher chakra triangle going mm -hmm. through the heart, that is the connector, the throat, the, the throat chakra, the third eye, and the crown chakra, you elevate your consciousness. When you pass this, it's like moving the energy, but it's not that simple. You have to practice and practice and practice because most people, and sometimes not all the time, live from the lower chakra triangle and connect and project their energy from there. You can speak from your lower chakras, you can identify when you get more training what chakra every person is speaking from. And that it's the energy that is leading, it's their core. Mm -hmm. And also these chakras, the energy have different aspects. If they are open or in an elevated state of consciousness, mm -hmm. or if they are Operating, operating from a lower, st low state of consciousness. Even your third eye, even your crown, the ego, can be here, right? Everywhere. This is our mind that blocks the flow of energy and the connection. So, going higher in the triangle is elevating your consciousness and it's elevating the state of consciousness within your own consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it opened, opens up a lot of faculties, the cities that, that we say in yogic sciences. 
all these abilities that we all have that are awakened when you basically awaken the dormant parts of your brain. So it's balancing your nervous system, moving the energy up, opening your, bra your mind, your brain, your consciousness, and elevating your, your state, altering your reality. And you don't need any external stimulation to do that. Yep. Yes, you can do it with plant medicine, and it's very powerful, and you have glimpses of consciousness, and but that doesn't last. So sometimes they need to go back and back and back and back, and it creates an addiction. So with this practice, you are building up. You never go back to where you were. And if you go back the ladder, you know how to go up the steps again. So it's a more sustainable way using your life force to elevate your consciousness and using your words as a goal, connect with your higher self, with your soul. The higher self is the highest aspect of your soul. And that's your guide. And that's your intuition, your third eye. That's why clearing all the lower chakras, it connects you with the higher chakras that it's your intuition, your inner knowing, your crown chakra, that it's awakening. You mentioned about our um, extra abilities. We um, activate the dormant part of the brain to re-engage or like re-enable re some special abilities. What are those kinds of special abilities that you're talking about? Well, it, it's difficult. It's different from everyone, for yeah. everyone. Of mm -hmm. course, it's we cannot generalize, but... Mm -hmm. What I can say in my way is, in my way, for me, is my intuition. I always had a strong intuition or perception, I, I would call it. The inner knowing is so, so strong now in me that I, I know what is going to happen. I know what people are, are thinking, what they are feeling. Um, even at a distance, I can know if that per what that person is thinking mm -hmm. about me, about a situation. Um, when there's a shift in energy, I would feel it before. Now it's even more clear. Before mm -hmm. I would get scared because I didn't know what to do, and I was a why, and not a shift on in energy in me, in mm -hmm. the other, in other people. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do with that information. And now it's it's beautiful because I can understand what is happening even before something happened. And I can say, this is my time to go or this is, okay, I want to go, go full in. And this intuition guides me and I use it to make decisions every single day. And to keep training it and to keep connecting with my soul. Another thing that was, I always loved it, but I was like, okay, I, if in another life, I said in my next life, I would love to be a singer because I love to sing, but I only sang sure. Luis Miguel, as we say, <laughs> not even in the shower, but Every time that I was feeling sad, I remember like playing Luis Miguel, that it's a Mexican singer that is very famous in Argentina, and we love it. It's famous in everywhere, not only in Argentina, but um, I loved him. And I could sing out loud and change my state. And I didn't know that I was creating resonance. And through this practice, chanting mantras was a discovery for me because I started connecting with Kundalini Yoga through mantras. I would be like chanting the entire night on a Saturday night, mantras, and changing my state and awakening. I don't know if I was awakening my Kundalini or not, because you don't know, but the change in, in, in consciousness was happening. So I could feel it. I could feel the vibration inside my body. I could feel the resonance that I was, that I was creating. So I would say that it also opened not only my third, but my, my throat chakra. Um, and the way that I speak is different. The tone of my voice, voice speak is different. The way 
I connect with others, the the state of power that I feel, that I feel, I always remember that when it had to do with business at my work, I was always very secure, but like very confident, self-confident 100%. But when I had to speak about marketing in a conference that I was always invited, I never wanted to do it because I was like, what is that I have to share with others that could be valuable for them that yeah. they already don't know? Mm-hmm. What, why no? So I always said, no, I never wanted to speak in public because mm-hmm. I was like, what am I going to say that they don't know already? It's not. And it's totally the opposite with Kundalini. I teach, I teach to big groups. I love sharing. I love sharing my experience. I do it from a place of total power, of total being in my, in, in my power mm-hmm. and sharing that with others. So that self-confidence uh, was also developed through that. And, mm-hmm. and the beauty of being alone and understanding that in solitude is how I reset and how I create. And having been someone who gave a lot of power to relationships and to partners, romantic partners, knowing that My first love or divine partner is my soul first, my higher self, was beautiful because I was never alone. Mm. I was, I, I, I will never be alone in that sense. And the more that I got deeper in that is the more community I created around and the more surrounded by people I am all the time. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, you know, there's this, um, I've heard, uh, tell me more about it, um, that Kundalini is a, also could be a dangerous practice if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, so what could go wrong in, uh, you know, cause you're working with energies and if you're not conscious or aware how the energies is being directed or flow, that could harm you. So can you talk about that? Yes. Um, I never experienced it myself, and I feel that that the reason why is because I chose the right teachers. Mm. So that would be the first thing. If your teacher is not grounded, and that means a lot of things. What does that mean? The first thing is do its practice, its own practice on a daily basis. It's not just, I will do my practice before the day that I have to teach. Mm. A teacher that is not doing its practice, it's not an empty vessel. It's not clean and clear. And we are sharing, projecting our energy. Every time that we are, as teachers are in front of a class, our energy is the one that is being projected and it's being shared with everyone. So we create like the setting in a way. If the teacher is not grounded, if the teacher was drinking the night before or is living out of integrity, is not walking the talk, um, that is part of its energy and that is being shared. The kriyas that they they teach or they choose to teach, the way that they project that energy, the chakras that we were saying Mm -hmm. that they are projecting their energy from, how they are speaking from the lower chakras or higher chakras. If they are not being of service as teachers, that is reflected in their speech, in their energy, in the environment that they are creating. And that is why it can be dangerous. It's not that will be dangerous that people can be hurt. But I will talk about another topic about this, being hurt with Kundalini after this. But that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. Choosing your teacher is the first thing. 
And I remember I was always very much in, in the Akashic Records. And I remember one of my Akashic Records guide some time ago when I was frustrated because I couldn't do the first training mm -hmm. that was canceled. Mm -hmm. She said to me, don't worry, because the right teacher will come to you in the moment that it has to come when you are ready. And that, teach and that teacher has to be grounded. And you have to be grounded to be able to receive that. So that is what can, what can create an, an, like a not safe environment. Because we are working with a lot of energy. Our energy as teachers, the energy of every individual and all together as a collective in a space and when, in which people are doing deep work of transformation, there's a lot of karma. And if the space is not protected by a teacher also that has a strong presence mm -hmm. in, in the practice, yes, a lot of energy from entities can get in the space. And we are super open and vulner vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So that's why we as teachers have to assess the energy of the group. It's not one formula fits all. Mm -hmm. I choose the Kriya mostly, and I always say it intuitively, minutes before the class started. And I can change it throughout the class. I had experiences in this. This was, I was telling this story the other day that one one person before I was in Tulum and I was about to start teaching and um, her and her boyfriend approached me and he said to me, are you ready to handle her energy because she's super powerful? And I was like, what is this? <laughs> what does this mean? <laughs> yeah, she's super powerful. She's going through a lot and we don't know what is happening with her. And I could feel like a kind of evil energy that I was going around, mm -hmm. that it was not her, but there was something around. And she was, she was looking at me and I said, okay, come, come, come here. Like, yep. what is happening? I don't know what is happening. I've been experiencing weird, crazy things at night throughout these past days and, uh, I was called to do a practice, but I don't know if you can handle that. And I was like, why am I creating this situation? Mm. And it's like, it put me in my, in my power. And I said, okay, if you are ready, I am ready. Mm -hmm. So let's see what happens. And it was very interesting because when, before the class started, it was a circle. And this person was looking at all the students that were right in front of her with a crazy, look that they were feeling intimidated. So I started to move one by one out of her sight because she was creating a, an energy in the space of fear. Mm -hmm. I could feel it and the students could feel it too. So she ended up like looking at nothing <laughs> with everyone around her. And it was very painful for her. The class was very painful for her. She mm -hmm. went through it. And at the end, she could release and she cried. She started crying. And then she started smiling. But there was something there that was blocking her and also interfering with the energy of the space. That's why it usually happens. But if you are not grounded as a teacher, if you are not in your place, in your power, that can affect everyone. And it affects everyone. So in that, in that sense, yes, it can be dangerous. Mm. And also, um, not Kundalini yoga, not Kundalini technology, but all these uses or misuses of Kundalini technology, not technology, the use of the word Kundalini. When it's not through the ancient form of yoga that claims that uh, awakens your kundalini energy. That is a process that has to happen at your own pace, consciously decided by you through a practice, 
and feeling it intuitively, intuitively throughout the entire process, yourself being conscious. When you let somebody else to do it for you, first of all, we don't know what it is happening because yeah. the Kundalini energy is activated by you. Yeah. You can awaken or open chakras that are not ready to be opened because mm -hmm. this is a process that goes at your own pace. And you can hurt yourself psychically, physically, emotionally, mentally. Mm -hmm. Because you are working with powerful energy vortexes that are the chakras that are related to organs and emotions. And people can have schizophrenia and any other mental disorders. And it's proven that that happens. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, that can be hurtful, but it's not kundalini yoga. It's mm -hmm. not kundalini technology. Mm -hmm. It's using the word kundalini to manipulate your energy mm. um is it similar to like uh say psychedelics can uh, uh on also uh basically make some people crazy because they were predisposed to it it, it just unlocks certain uh energies or is that a d different uh, no it's a different thing um I sacred plants, sacred medicine, and, and psychedelics or psilocybin, um, that's medicine. And I have total reverence for them, 100%. Mm -hmm. um, no, this is not what I'm referring to. Mm -hmm. This is when they use the name Kundalini to manipulate your energy and you allow that to happen. Mm. And... Um, When your kundalini energy awakens, mm -hmm. it's a very smooth process mm -hmm. that elevates your consciousness. You don't start moving like crazy. When mm -hmm. that happens, basically, is your nervous system that it's being stimulated and your chakras are not open and you are reacting in that way. So it's basically a response of a nervous system that is not balanced, mm -hmm. and it has to get to balance. You're saying every time you see someone having the reaction of kind of like shaking and, and things like that, this is a, a result of a energetic blockage um, and a lot of energy going through the system and uh, the energy is just being uh, stopped at a certain point. Yes. Uh -huh. And there are different ways. You can do mm. it yourself through breath work, to kundalini practice, or to any other practice that mm. moves your energy. Or someone can stimulate it from outside. And okay. this is what I am referring to that can be hurt, hurtful or that can be dangerous. When you do it yourself through a practice, that is not dangerous. Mm. And you can always open your eyes. You can always stop the process. Mm. But when you have someone doing it mm. to you, and you don't know who that person is, what that person was doing. Again, this can be a practice that is done in, in that when it is done in integrity by the right practitioner can create a result that can be beneficial for you. Mm -hmm. I don't know 100% mm -hmm. because this is not my practice. Mm -hmm. I can speak for Kundalini, but I am talking about the biomechanics of how Mm. energy works and why awakening your kundalini can be dangerous I'm, I'm answering your question yeah yeah so kundalini itself as a practice with the right teacher no mm -hmm. but if someone not in the kundalini yoga mm -hmm. context manipulates your kundalini energy yeah that can be dangerous and then if somebody let's say decides to practice on their own let's say they found your video i don't know they, <laughs> they found some knowledge about how that's to not on their own that will be oh. following a video but there are in the space uh, no one else is involved in the intention uh at that moment just just them 
uh, is there danger of of not knowing how to do it correctly and not doing it right, you know? No, oh. you can overdo it, yes, okay. but that has to be you are overdoing it and you can hurt yourself. What, what does that mean, o overdoing it? What Going too fast or doing more repetitions than needed okay. or doing the posture that it's not... You can be following a video, but if you haven't had practice with a teacher before that guided you, you can mm -hmm. do it wrong and you can mm -hmm. hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. And you can damage organs or you can... You can for example, one, one example, mm -hmm. basic example that it's usually not done correctly yep. and not teached correctly by teachers. Mm -hmm. It's breath of fire. Okay. If you do breath of fire incorrectly, mm -hmm. you can create anxiety. Okay. And it's the total opposite of what you're trying to do because mm -hmm. through breath of fire, the idea is to get to your meditati meditative neutral mind mm -hmm. and connect deeper. Even though it's a rapid movement, but it has to be done correctly. That's why the recommendation is to teach with a teacher, to mm. teach, sorry, to practice with a teacher. With a teacher yeah. Uh -huh. um, and, and so you wouldn't recommend anyone um, learning Kundalini practice on their own, basically. The power of Kundalini is done in groups, too. Mm hmm so go somewhere and do it, practice with a group. Mm -hmm. Become part of this because the collective energy that we create all together, we create a vortex of mm -hmm. energy that it's incredible. It's so powerful that you don't want to do it alone. If you do that, if you do your sadhana, if you can every morning or when you can, and then you want to practice with videos, that's a different story. In fact, in my membership, that's what I have. I have an app. I have videos that it's a library of recordings of classes and events. So the members go and practice whenever they can on the go on their phones. But they also come to class. They also, if they cannot do it in person, they do it online. Yep. When we are all together in groups, it works the same way. Mm -hmm. But you are being guided. Us as teachers during Kundalini practice, we don't do the practice. We don't do the practice. We have to hold space and see what is happening to guide because of this. Because there's a lot of energy that is happening. People sometimes cry. People, people sometimes scream. They have different reactions, conscious and unconscious, to what is happening to them. People are going through deep processes of transformation during the classes. Mm. Could you share with me the benefits of doing it together as like contributing to this uh, vortex of energy? How has that manifested in the 3D that could be either measured or observed or uh, just uh, by someone external to say, wow, this magic here? Yeah. That happened several times. Yeah. I. Every time that, for example, when I teach at Soho, when people mm. are on a Friday night at 8 p.m. walking around the area where we're practicing, they stop and some of them join us mm. because they say, I can't believe what I'm feeling. The energy is so strong that I wanted to do it. And people like use towels <laughs> they use for the beach. They put it on the floor and they start practicing. Mm -hmm. And this happened not once, several times. Or in houses, for example, if we practice in my house that I do my sadhana every morning in my room or practice at houses of, you you remember that I that mm -hmm. I also teach sometimes at big houses of mm -hmm. friends. The energy that you feel in that house, it's mm -hmm. like a blessing. People feel it. It's like the entire house is mm -hmm. activated. It's a, there's an activation that happens. Imagine... We are vortices, vortexes of energy. Imagine if 50 vortexes all together doing the same thing with the same purpose mm. activate the space. It travels. <laughs> mm -hmm. People feel it. People come. People mm. start coming and coming and coming. That's why more and more people are doing Kundalini Yoga. The, the time you experience it and you, and if you do it with a group, you feel so supported. Yeah. 
and we elevate each other and we also heal each other. What do you think would happen if um, half the planet um, <laughs> with, the, with the right teacher do it all at the same time with the same intention? What oh my God, that would be incredible. You are giving me ideas. <laughs> I would love to do something like that. Yeah, I said half the planet because the other half probably is going to be sleeping. You can't, maybe you can get everyone, uh, like some some people might have to just take a little time off sleep and it would be cool to, uh, to yes. help whatever number of billion of people uh, uh, do it all at the same time. I wonder what would happen. Well, Matias Di Stefano, that yep. you know, he... He activated the Kundalini energy of the earth in different places, in different spots. And I remember one time, I think it was for an equinox two years ago, I teach the class exactly at the same time that he was doing that. Mm. And he was doing that in different places at the same time too, activating mm -hmm. the Kundalini energy of the earth. Mm -hmm. And you feel it. You mm. feel it. That's why when we do our sadhana, we do it at 4.30 a.m. or 5. It's two hours before the sun rises at Amrit Vela. Mm. But it's a powerful time. But it's also more powerful because there are millions of yogis doing their sadhana at that time. Mm -hmm. Meditating, doing kundal practicing. practicing practicing kundalini or any other way of wor uh, breath work all together at that time the prana energy is super strong by physics the 60 degrees the sun to the horizon but also for all the energy that we are all doing our practice at the same time all together mm -hmm. i remember that in i think in india with my with my friends at that time in, in the training, we said this, we should do activate the different points of the earth because we will live in different places. Mm -hmm. And that at the same time, and do Kundalini all together. We usually do that when there's, it's a birthday of one of our gurus or yes, a special day in, for mm -hmm. Hinduism. But Yeah, everything will explode. It will be so, great. <laughs> how much the locality uh, matter? Like you do uh, classes online. Uh, how is that different from doing it to get like in the same space? Well, it changes, of course. Okay. And moreover, if you need more support, if you are a more advanced practitioner or yogi, You connect with yourself, you do, you do it yourself, it's super strong. And when we are sharing the space energetically online, you know, energy doesn't, there's no time, there's no space, so you feel it. But when you, maybe you need more support and you are starting more a beginner, or you need support at that particular time, yeah. doing it together in the same space with people, that can be more healing and is it healing uh more on energetic level or your physical senses only see other people so you basically you're not distracted by some other environment that you might be in and you're only looking at a small screen and that's why part of your attention is spread uh into other things it's not as focused but when you are in the space with other people all of your attention is right there Uh, but what if it's it's some kind of like a virtual experience where, again, it puts all of your attention into that experience? Would that, um, would that be pretty much the same as being in the space? Because from the way I understand it, the, it's, it's a non-local, um, your energy centers might not be like a, a local ex localized experience. Uh, let's say if you are practicing in different parts of the world, you're contributing to the same uh, energy source that's not necessarily split in far, far away in the distance. Is that, do I understand it correctly? Or there is a difference between um, like a uh, in-person uh, fully immersed and virtual fully immersed? Of course there are differences. Of course, what you mm. were saying is correct. Mm. 
your attention and your energy are focused in the same place, in the same space with mm -hmm. the people around. Mm -hmm. We are merging our el psychoelectromagnetic fields with other yeah. people. So there's more work that we do because our psychoelectromagnetic field is expanding, mm -hmm. our aura is expanding more with this practice and it starts to interact with others. Mm -hmm. And we all have different essences in our psychomagnetic fields. Mm -hmm. So that can contribute to our healing, to our transformation, to our focus, to the entire experience mm. in different ways. When you do it alone in your place, guided, online with a group of people, virtually, mm -hmm. your psycho-electromagnetic field is more contained in that sense. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can go even deeper. But again, if you have more practice, mm. if not, you need the support of others and it's better to be contained by others because this, when I said we heal each other, when our psychoelectromagnetic field is getting stronger, mm -hmm. the vibration is growing and this is what it is about, mm -hmm. we start affecting others. And if we need support, we receive that. Sometimes people cannot practice and they lay down. They receive the healing anyway mm -hmm. because we are all in the with the same purpose, in the mm. same Understand. syntony, in yeah. the same frequency. Sometimes. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, is there value in creating, let's say, uh, virtual reality experiences that centered around uh, a more immersive practice? Uh, to replace the virtual, the current virtual practice of uh, just looking at a 2D screen on the small little laptop or something like that versus a fully simulated experience where you see other participants. Is that better than a, I'm not saying is that better than a real one, obviously it's not, but is that better than the, the current way of doing the virtual experience? I like these questions. Yeah. I. It will be great to do it and to experience it because yeah. none of us have the answer. Okay. But what I can say that cannot be replicated I is the, yeah. what I can say that cannot be replicated is the energy. Mm -hmm. So what you really feel when the real people are doing the work, even mm -hmm. if it's online. So I wouldn't replace human beings doing their work online on the screen even though you are doing it virtually with a simulation because mm -hmm. that can be like a placebo yeah you there's someone there next to you doing it but it's not a human being so what what body mm. is expressing through them None. We have 10 bodies, mental, physical, emotional, and six energetic ones. The aura is one of them, the psychoelectromagnetic field. Mm. And how we, what, what, what body of yours is affecting that? Maybe you feel safe because there's something, an object around, but you don't feel the energetics of that. Mm -hmm. You not you don't feel uplifted or or even taken down if you allow it. Right. Yeah. The reason why I'm I'm bringing that up is because there is such thing as like remote healing. There are healers who can, uh, um, or at least they claim to be. I don't necessarily have the data to prove it, but it's out there that uh, people can do remote healing. They don't have to be in the same space with them. And if that's true, that also means that there is this uh, non-local connection between humans and when we are practicing kundalini yoga or any other intentional practices, we are entering this uh, non-local domain, uh, right? And so if that's true, then creating a, a virtual experience that puts all of your uh, physical attention, like your eyes, your hearing, into that space of presence with other humans practicing that same thing, should enhance that experience that, that uh and and i'm i'm always looking for ways how to utilize technology in a conscious way to 
to promote higher consciousness and to uh, help us evolve better. Yes. Yeah. I, I understand and I get your point. Mm. And uh, yes, we're all connected in the ether. Mm -hmm. um, that it's not even in this plane sometimes mm -hmm. in different dimensions. But um, yeah, the energetics of a human being or the energetics of a soul um, cannot be replaced. We can add elements of technology to enhance it, yes, but without losing that part that is more organic and natural. Mm -hmm. um, and even us, when, when we start teaching all of us, when we do our practice, we chant the mantra that it's calling in all the teachers that came before us and will come after. We're calling that energy, that wisdom mm -hmm. to be channeled. So we use it. So we're always channeling, connecting, connecting, connecting. And between us, among us, and with spirit, source, God, divine, um, div divine teachers, masters, ascended mm. masters, guides. As long as that is not lost, that it's what really happens. That's why there's no time or space. Remote healing is, of course, happens and it, it's valid 100%. Mm -hmm. Now, when you want to replace that with technology, I'm not sure that can mm. because that part is missing, that it's, that it's the energy, the mm -hmm. aura. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like uh, there are different levels on which we connect that are not physical and maybe yet not measurable. Maybe the science is not there to um, measure different la layers of connection and some of the layers are probably non-physical and on those layers you you could uh, it maybe doesn't matter where you are in space 100%. but there are some layers on which uh, the physical pr proximity matters a lot totally yeah totally but remotely you can do healing you can channel and transfer energy transmissions 100 mm percent -hmm. um what i'm saying is that in person if you need more support, that it's that it's a better a scenario. But if you don't need support to do it, uh, you can perfectly do it online. Mm -hmm. For people who are living uh, busy, you know, lives in in the world, corporate, whatever jobs that they have, how how would they incorporate a practice like that? Uh, what would be your recommendation how do people start like uh, if it sounds interesting to them they have no idea where to start uh, what would you tell them well i have a lot of people that are going through that because okay. that's that's mostly who come to me the ones that are working and they need to release or they need to connect with themselves still being in the in the matrix or in the 3d a lot of these people are the ones that join sadhana every morning before they go to work at 5 or 5 a.m. Mm. till 7. They can do it every day or whenever they can. And they, the most important thing is to start. Come to one class in person, experience. Take a private class. Some people prefer to take one first private class to get used to the technology and make sure that they are doing things correctly. And then they go to the group level. And I created this app so people could practice Kundalini wherever they are with their phones and whenever they can do it. And I also have practices that are 15 minutes because I'm, I'm currently creating a program that it's called Kundalini for the BC soul, that okay. it's exactly these souls that are busy. Mm -hmm. And they are immersed in their daily lives in the material world, and right. they don't have that much time to connect mm -hmm. with the spiritual world. So thinking exactly about this is that I have so many touch points. Mm -hmm. It's the private classes, the, glo the, the group classes, online and in person, the app where you can practice, sadhana every morning which you connect when you can i'm always there 
unless I cannot make it and I let people know in advance. Yeah. But start where you can, but mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. Do you see over time um, more and more people are practicing Kundalini? Uh, uh, or are there other competing practices uh, that maybe uh, people are also taking? Like, do you see other um, modalities that are out there that okay. maybe what I'm trying to ask um, do you see the trend of more people are starting to practice Kundalini out there or is it always right around the same amount of people percentage of people who are doing the practice what I feel is that during the pandemic uh -huh. there was like a boom of people right. trying to connect deeper within because mm -hmm. they couldn't do anything outside. Right. So it forced people to connect mm -hmm. within because mm -hmm. they couldn't even connect with other people mm -hmm. in person. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I will go inside. And there's no coincidence that that was a boom for Kundalini Yoga. So it will continue growing, yes, because you see how this works and how people are transforming and you don't have to be a swami or, or, or a, a monk in a cave to do that. Mm -hmm. We were talking about that the other day with Swami Shidananda, that there are two ways to do it. Either you are a householder or you are a monk. Mm. So here we have to continue living our lives and the connection within is every day is more and more important. And after what happened in 2020, it's very clear that we need to do that. In my case, and I tried different modalities and different practices, and to me, Kundalini Yoga is the most powerful one. That's why I keep doing it. And I keep adding other modalities to enhance this one, like for example, Akashic Records healing mm. that I'm doing the last certification advanced level three to keep connecting deeper with my soul, with my soul, with my soul. That's happening with me and that's happening with other people that start yeah. maybe with yoga. But traditional yoga, the different way, types of yoga, it got so distorted in some areas that the, the deep meaning or the purpose of this ancient technology is a little bit lost because it's mm. more used for the fitness or for the fun or for the trendy. With Kundalini Yoga, honestly, if you come to class and you do it, you really want to do it <laughs> because it's challenging. It's not just a trend that, oh, I wear the nice clothes and I go and do Kundalini and then mm. it's, it breaks you, it mm. opens you up your heart, and it, it puts you to work. It's a challenge. It a, challenges your entire system. So that's why it is so powerful. So I see a lot of resistance of people sometimes to do it. Their egos, my ego was also resisting at the beginning with Kundalini. But once you start practicing and do it and, and feel how you transform your reality and create your own reality the way you manifest and calling miracles every day it's worth it it's mm -hmm. worth being pushing yourself every day to do the practice what i always say during the practice and, and my students laugh is i always say keep going because it's you want to you want to give up you always want to give up you're mm -hmm. like i don't want to do it what am i doing here why am i torturing myself so there are a lot of other practices, but I feel that only the real, authentic ones that show transformation mm -hmm. are the ones that will stay. And the trends as everything, like a trend will pass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's why this isn't very the most ancient form of yoga. Um, yeah, I think this is um, maybe a beautiful way to uh, kind of wrap up the, the conversation. Maybe for those who are still around listening, um, let us know in the comments, just say Kundalini. Um, 
see if you're still around uh, to enjoy this <laughs> conversation. Um, maybe um, the last few notes uh, point people into uh, any resources, maybe some events that are coming up uh, for you or any other things that you would like to share as a last note. No. Well, I don't want to say anything in particular because this will live in, in, in social media. Mm -hmm. So I prefer to give points of contact in which they can always go for reference of what is coming. Mm -hmm. That is my Instagram. Mm -hmm. That is Chisel Fumada. And we will put it in the comments. Comments and show notes, yeah. And uh, Kundalini with Giselle is my website with mm -hmm. Kundalini with Giselle.com. And Kundalini Tribe is my app. So all the information of all the events and all everything that I'm always creating and co-creating mm -hmm. is there. Beautiful. Thank you. Giselle. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.